بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وأسوتنا وقائدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وبعد Special brothers and sisters <coughs> Alhamdulillah, we praise and we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us the tawfiq to be here today. Most of you fasted, I was told, you had iftar. May Allah accept your fast, reward you, increase you in your sincerity and in your good deeds, inshaAllah, and all of us. Like the brother mentioned, I actually came to UCL I was just telling that the brothers came to collect me at King's Cross about three, four years, four years. I can't remember, was it three years or four years or five years? I had a talk here. Does that, is anybody still studying right now who was there that time? It was five. It was probably five. Nobody, nobody attended the lecture. I still know the title. So it was recorded, it's on the internet somewhere. I still remember that because it was a controversial topic and I had to talk about balancing the topic. And it was in a larger lecture theatre, I remember. There's quite a few people over there. Was, I don't know how many years ago. Three or four or five. I'm just completely, yeah, I forget. I might maybe five years. The title was Spirit of Sufism, if I just tell you. Or the reality of Sufism. So basically trying to explain what is right and what's wrong, I remember. Today's topic is very important. Like the brother said, the hadith which... Uh, has been recorded by Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim in their respective Sahih collections. <coughs> it's a famous hadith. It's an authentic, very rigorously authenticated hadith. And you've probably ha- had a talk on the beginning or the part of, of the hadith or what, one aspect of the hadith. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, سَبْعَةٌ يُظِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلَّ إِلَّا ظِلَّهُ There are certain people, seven people, and the list is there in the hadith. Those people who will be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, they'll be under the shade of Allah. On a day when there'll be no shade except Allah's shade. In other words, there'll be no protection, no refuge from anyone, from, from the difficulties, from the calamities of that day. It's a very difficult day, the, the, the day of judgment. But these people will be protected, preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of them, he said, and this is what our talk is focusing on today, is a person, a rajulun, talabatu imra'atun, a man who was seduced or called by a woman, talabatu, da'atu. The word in, in one of the narrations is talabatu. It's, it's a man who was trying to be seduced by a woman. Now this does not only mean a man being seduced, remember, the words in the hadith and in the Quran, sometimes there are about specific in, you know, genders, but it isn't rest- it's not restricted to that. There's a general application in many of these texts of the Quran and Sunnah. Otherwise, if everything was explained in, every, in detail, then you'd have 800 volumes of the Quran. And you'd have 200 rak'at of taraweeh and hadith as well. Like the other day, just last week I had a course somewhere and I was saying, Allah says in the Quran, He's giving a list of people who a man cannot marry. Allah says, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُكُمْ وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ وَعَمَّاتُكُمْ There's a list. Now when Allah said, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ You can't marry your biological mother, a man cannot. Right? That doesn't mean that you can marry your grandmother. Everybody agrees. If you can't marry your mom, you can't marry your grandmother. But Allah didn't go into saying your mother, your grandmother. And if somebody has a great grandmother, then also a great grandmother. And then if somebody, even a great great grandmother, then a great grandmother. Otherwise, you'll have a large text of the Quran. So this is generally, there are general principles given in the Quran, in the Sunnah, and then you use your own understanding to see what kind of application it is. Likewise, in this hadith, 
He said, a man who is seduced by a woman, invited to commit a sin by a, a woman. He said, رَجُلٌ طَلَبَتْهُ إِمْرَأَةٌ And this woman is not just any woman. Now, so it's not only restricted to a man being invited by a woman, it's also the general implication is that a woman being tried to be seduced by a man. A man tries to flirt with a woman. Right? That's also understood there. So in either case, a man being seduced by a woman or a woman being seduced by a man who are not related to him, they are not husband wives, and, and this, this relates to also flirtatious conversation and whatever we know what's unlawful and I'll talk about some of those things. But just to read the hadith first and foremost before you. And this woman is no ordinary woman. Right? I mean if somebody was, a man was being seduced by a 105 year old woman and you say, you know what? I'm so just chased. Alhamdulillah, I had no, no intention of sinning. And an old lady with a stick and try to seduce, yeah? And I say, you know what? In the khaf Allah, I fear Allah. And I say, mashallah, you know what? A woman trying to seduce me? And I, I'm so chaste. It's no big deal. Likewise, a, a woman, you know, there's an old man, right? And she try, he tries to seduce or flirt with her. And of course, she probably slap him one. What are you trying to do? So that, that's no big deal. But a woman in this hadith, Rajulun da'athu imra'atun thatu mansabin wa jamal. The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he said two things. This woman is someone of beauty. In other words, there's that attraction there. The woman is someone whom you are attracted to as a man. Remember, attraction and beauty is relative. You can't say this person is beautiful and this person is not. Beauty is in the, it's in the eyes of the beholder. So it's, it's a relative theory. You might find someone might find someone beautiful, others might not even look at that person twice. So, and beauty is not just in the physical appearance. It's, there's a lot of things, the way a person talks, the way a person's character is, his akhlaq or her akhlaq, adat and mannerisms and everything. So someone whom you are attracted to, a man is seduced by a woman whom he is really inclined towards. He is attracted towards that woman. And likewise a woman being encouraged to commit a sin and flirted with by a man, a flirts with her, whom she is in a way attracted to. And mansab. The second thing the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, not just a woman who has beauty and you're attracted to, it's someone of position of authority. Of, of a position and rank in, in the society, in, in, in your locality, in your community. Someone who, who has respect and someone whom you respect, you have respect for in the heart. Like a brother, you know, mashallah, this brother, his head, I'm not going to give, start giving examples of Amirs of societies and ISOCs or whatever because I did that one place and somebody said, you talking about me? I said, I'm not talking about you, it's just general. Someone, you know, like in your locality, there's some, just someone of respect. And you look up to, to that person. You look up towards that woman or that sister or that brother. Right? This man was invited by this woman to commit a sin. <laughs> Meaning there's every possible reason for him to commit a sin. And there are no barriers. There are no barriers. It's very easy to fall into sin. Yet the only thing that is preventing and stopping this man or a woman from fornicating, and not just zina, we will talk about some things, zina and the things that lead to fornication, all the sins he avoids and he says, Inni akhaf Allah. I fear that's the title of the talk. I fear Allah. It's actually the words of the hadith. Inni Allah. Indeed, I fear Allah. I mean that's just a, such a strong statement. Such a strong statement. In other words, he avoids the sin because of the fear of Allah. Because there's nothing that will prevent a man or a woman from committing a sin in any area of your life, of our lives, in any area except the fear of Allah. If we have the fear of Allah in our souls, in our lives, then, then that's what will prevent us from committing a sin. There's nothing else. There's nothing else. Even authority position cannot, in of itself, prevent a person from a sin. 
you might just due to force and pressure of parents of the government or whatever you are the authority because of force and pressure you might avoid some sins but in the khalwa in, in isolation in seclusion there are certain things that nobody can force so the fear of Allah inni akhaf Allah another term in the Quran used for fear of Allah is taqwa as well taqwa is a very comprehensive word Allah says in the Quran ya nas, so many places ya nas, taqwa rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله and fear Allah and Allah says yeah, you know the three verses that are recited in the khutbah khutbah al-hajah which is the sunnah of the messenger of Allah صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم which is recited before the marriage ceremony the imam when you go to I mean if, you, if anybody is married here I don't know but if you get married or if you know when the imam is, is reciting the sermon the khutbah of marriage it's a sunnah there are three verses that are chosen from the Qur'an and none of them have any mention of nikah or marriage in them. None of them. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, could have chosen any other verse from the Qur'an that talks about marriage. But no. All three verses have one thing in common which is taqwa. God consciousness. Being conscious and aware of the fact that everything I say, everything I do, everything I write, any gestures I make, I will be question, question about them. I will be answerable to my Lord on the day of judgment. Special reminder at the time of nikah, because now before marriage you were by yourself, alone. Now you have extra responsibilities. There are hukuk, there are rights and responsibilities. You're going to live 24-7 with your spouse and your children. There will be other family members. right? Remember, anything you say to your spouse, you will have to answer to Allah in the next life. That's why taqwa is being reminded, fear of Allah. It's a very important part, fear of Allah. You know, because that, if, if we realize, this is what taqwa is, if we are conscious, we realize of the fact that anything I say or do, I have to my, answer my Lord on the day of judgment about anything I say or do, or even write on the internet forums, and nobody knows who you are. Yeah, you might be on a forum somewhere, and some you might just sign off as Abdullah and your name is probably Zainab. You know, that's what happens nowadays. People, and because anonymity, you know, now people just because of, you know, you don't know who you are, emailing here and there, people are anonymous. And, and people say all sorts of things and do all sorts of things. Only the fear of Allah, whatever we say, whatever we do, whatever we write, even the actions, everything in the next life, you know, it's, there's going to be like a video being played. Everything, all the actions. مَا يَلْفِضُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ Allah says, any statement, any word, any utterance, any pronouncement, anything that comes out from the mouth. مَا يَلْفِضُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ Except there's an angel making a record of everything. So we have to be very careful. This is our understanding of the next life. So in this hadith, he said, I fear Allah, right? And he avoided the sin. This fear of Allah is such a strong, such a strong quality. It's just so amazing. And we need to inculcate that in our life. You know, there's another hadith as well, which, which is relating to that. It's a famous hadith in many books, Sahih Bukhari and Muslim and elsewhere, where you might have heard of it. There were three people who, you know, there were the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he said three people, they, they left, they came out, they, they were traveling. And for asabahumul matar, there was heavy rain. So they, because of the rain, what they did, they went into a cave to just save themselves from the rain. They were in the cave, what happened? A sakhra, a, a uh, massive rock, shut the entrance of the cave. They're locked inside, they can't go anywhere. They were, it was on a, in, a, in a mountain, nobody can hear them. <coughs> you know the miners? Remember the chili miners? Do you know what happened? The Chilean miners they were like there for how many years, uh, mo- days or months, I don't know. It's just like that, right in the middle of a mountain. In a cave they went there, the Jabalin and a Sakhra came and blocked. So what should we do? There's no way, nobody can find us. So they said to each other, look, let's make dua to Allah. Let's pray to Allah. Let's ask Allah to just miraculously uh, remove this rock. Let's pray to Allah. Let's pray to Allah in a way that we, we ask Allah through our, some of the good deeds that we, we, we have practiced before. 
Each one of them. One of them said, oh Allah, you know, there's two others which I don't want to go into, but I want to mention the third one. One of them said, oh Allah, you know, he, he had parents that he stood all night long. He brought, he used to feed them milk and they went to sleep and he stood all night long till morning and they woke up and he said, oh Allah, if I've done this for your sake only, for your pleasure, I ask you, I beg you to, to move this rock from the entrance of the cave. One third, a third of it moved. And the second one, he had something where he had someone who he had employed and then he didn't want his wages and then he came back after such a long... So he took his wages and invested it. It's a long hadith, but there's no time. I don't want to go into the details. But And, and he invested it and, and there was a lot of cattle, sheep that, that was generated from this. And he came back and he said, I want my wages back. He said, look, all of this is yours because I used... And he was quite shocked. He said, are you you know, making a mockery out of me? He said, no, this is all yours, take it. He said, oh Allah, if I done this only for your sake, remove the rock from the cave. Another third, two thirds. And the third one, and this is the one, I mean this is relating to this hadith. He said, oh Allah, and this, these are, they are making the dua. You know, they are, they are making, they, they, they are praying to Allah, they're making dua. And he said, oh Allah, I used to have a first cousin whom I used to be in madly love. Someone that you're after, you know, for years. I want to marry her, but people are not, not allowing that. I wanted to commit I wanted to fornicate with her for a long time. I used to love her extremely. I used to love her extremely. Extremely, I used to love her extremely. And I used to try to seduce her. She used to always say no. And then she was in a, once she got into a very desperate state financially. And she said, if you get 100 dinars, then I'll allow you to fornicate with me. Right? I mean, for them, at that time, 100 dinars was like a, a lot of amount of money. It's, just not, it's not like 100 pounds. It's, it's a lot. Mi'at a dinar. So he said, فَسَعِيتُ حَتَّى جَمَعْتُهَا I, I worked for it, because I was so desperate to even have one uh, session of, in which I, I, I am close to her. And I can unite with her. He said, فَسَعَيْتُ I tried. I worked. فَجَمَعْتُ I, I, فجمعت I gathered 100 dinar. Imagine working like you're thinking, oh yes. She said she wants 100. I tried to take advantage of the fact, he said, of the fact that she was financially in a very bad position and she was desperate for some money. So I went out, I worked day and night hard, very, you know, really worked hard so that I can gather, gather money, gather the money and then I can do whatever I want to do. And I gave it to her. And then the hadith says, subhanAllah, the words of the hadith are amazing. It's, قعدت, this is quite open and frank. When I sat in between her legs, literal translation. That's in the hadith, right? Oh Allah, I sat in between, like I was there just, which was that final stages of fornication, actual, illicit, and lawful sexual intercourse. Qalat, she said to me, Ittaqillah. Right at that moment she said to me, Fear Allah. Imagine that position, that, that, that situation. Imagine, what, he's been working for years, gathering hundred dinar, and then he's got his way, and now he's right on the final stages, and he's just about to fornicate, and she says, Ittaqillah, fear Allah. If you have fear of Allah, you want Wala tafaddal khatam. Don't break the seal. In another riwayah, Wala taftah al khatam. Don't open the seal. Because she was a virgin girl. She said, Fear Allah, I am desperate, right? I am desperate, and this is the reason why I'm allowing you to do this. But if you have fear of Allah, fear Allah, and don't open the seal. And it hit him. This is a hadith, this is a sound hadith. وَلَا تَفُضَّ الْخَاتَمْ إِلَّا بِحَقِّهِ Unless by due right, which is through marriage, through a halal way. He said, فَقُمْتُ وَتَرَكْتُهَا As soon as I heard that, I stood up and I left. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they, he made this dua. Oh Allah, in كُنْتَ تَعْلَمْ Oh Allah, you know for a fact. And if I do that, I did that for your, only for your pleasure, just, just for your sake, only for, because of you, oh Allah. No, any, no other reason. Nobody was watching me. I was there. I was able to fornicate. 
Right? It was only for the sake of Allah, not for any shame. Not because, oh, I might get caught here, or people might see us here, or something might happen. There was no way for him to get caught or anything. But only for the sake of Allah. فَفْرَجْ عَنَّا فَرْجَ Open the cave entrance and remove and, and another third was moved. And all three of them, the whole rock moved and the entrance was open. This hadith is very similar to that hadith. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to say a few things. These were just two hadith. I thought I'll start my talk off with these two hadith in time. I don't know how much time I have, but how much time do I have? Okay. It's 5.50 right now, I think. Okay, it's fine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's our creator. He's created us, right? We believe in Allah creating us. We know Allah created us. Does everybody believe that Allah created them? Okay. He's created us with certain needs and desires. Allah is the creator of the human being. On one hand, we just read the hadith. When a woman is seducing you, a woman seduces you and invites you to a sin. And you say, Inni Allah, I fear Allah. That woman said to him, Ittaqillah. He had a desire, he had a need. But he suppressed his desire, he suppressed his need. This tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is our Lord, he is, he is our Creator. He has created certain things within us. He knows we have certain desires and needs. Because He's our Creator. He has created a need within the human, man or woman. All sorts of needs. We get hungry, we are thirsty. Right? We are hungry, we are thirsty. And there are many things, the temperament, the nature of the human, the way Allah has created human beings, he has created certain things because of a wisdom that Allah knows best. A human being, man or woman, naturally has this desire and need which needs to be fulfilled, which is the desire of lust, which is a desire of, of wanting companionship from a member of the opposite gender, this desire to be in the company of the opposite gender. It's absolutely natural, normal. Don't worry. Right? Some, this brother once came to me and said, you know, I, I just have this image, desire, I wish I don't have a desire. I mean, this is somebody came to the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uthman ibn al-Mad'oon. It's in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, in Kitab al-Nikah. وَلَوْ أَذِينَ لَهُ لَخْتَصَيْنَا رَدَّ النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم على Uthman al-Tabadtula. He wanted to get castrated. He wanted to remove from himself the desire, the sexual desire, so that he can live in solitude. وَلَوْ أَذِينَ لَهُ لَخْتَصَيْنَا تَبَتُّلْ مِنْ سَتَرْكُ النِّكَاحِ To live a life of celibacy. And he asked the Messenger of Allah, who's Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, can I live a life of celibacy? Which means that I, I, you know, live a life of celibacy, I don't have desires. وَلَوْ أَذِينَ لَهُ لَخْتَصَيْنَا Had the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, allowed him, the companions say, that لَخْتَصَيْنَا We would have got ourselves castrated, some of us. Which means, we just want to live in solitude. If that was the case, Allah wouldn't have created this. There's, there's a reason, there's a wisdom. All these natural desires created in the human being. Anger. You know, Allah, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to one companion, he said, Ya Rasulullah, Messenger of Allah. He was in a hurry. He said, give me nasiha wa awjiz. Give me a short, brief nasiha. He said, la taghdam. Don't get angry. Second time. Faradda da mirara. La taghdam, la taghdam. Thrice. Now we know anger is wrong. We know anger is something we need to avoid. People go into you know, some anger management tra treatment clinics. And we have, Islamically, Allah says in the Quran, we, we, we know there are ways of removing anger and controlling one's anger. Why did Allah create anger? If it was evil, in of itself it's not evil. It's the misuse of anger. And there's a reason because of which Allah created anger within us. Because if there is a need, there are certain times, if you were absolutely passive, no anger whatsoever, somebody could come right in front of you and you know, your, your father, your mother, your parents, and you know, just slap him around and hit him and say, don't do that. It's not good. And someone's just literally physically abusing your parents right in front of you. 
Don't do that. <laughs> you don't get angry? Nothing makes you angry? No human being is like that. There's a wisdom behind it. Likewise, Allah has created this sexual desire, passion, lust in a human, man or woman. It's absolutely normal, natural. And there's a wisdom. Because of that, we, have, we are here in this world. We wouldn't be here. There's a sexual desire, passion, because of which we were born. Of course, Allah is a khaliq, but there's the means. It's litanasul. To have a lineage, to have a progeny, to, to have people coming. Allah uses this as a apparent means of people, people coming into this world. So this is, it's, it's absolutely natural, normal to have a sexual desire, a passion, lust within oneself. There's nothing wrong. Don't feel guilty about it. Okay? Don't feel guilty for having the desire. And also, some have less, some have more. That's absolutely normal. Just like some people have more anger, some have less anger, right? Some people have more anger, some have less. We've been created, you know, Allah has created us like that. You know, some, some people are very angry by nature. And we know, the people who are angry, they know themselves, and yes, I, I really need to control myself, because I'm very angry. I get very easily irritated, very easily angered. Some people are really cool, cool as a cucumber, you know, you can... Probably it takes them like something major for them to maybe even get up now, you know, something. But they're just so calm and cool about situations. Different people, we all look different. We all look different. Every human being is different from another. So Allah's created all of us differently. Even our temperaments, our natures, all separate. Some have less anger, some have more anger. Some have more sexual passion and lust, some have less. Nothing to worry about. The ones that have more doesn't mean you're you're somewhat a bad Muslim or worse. No, it's not like that. What the difference is that you have to, the one who has more lust and more easily seduced by the opposite gender, your challenge is greater than someone who can control himself. That's what it is. The one who is more angry, there's more challenge on him. He has to really control himself from being angry. And some people, they just they don't really need to do that much. And Allah creates different things in different people. This is taqseem, division of Allah. So someone, some people have less, some have more. There's nothing wrong. Less, less, more, less. Sexual passion, desire. But the responsibility for us is that we need to control it, we need to channel it. Just like anger, we need to control it. There are only certain legitimate usages of anger. You can't have anger manifested in any way, shape, or form. Likewise, lust and a sexual passion it needs to be controlled. It needs to be controlled. And this is what Allah is saying in Surah Al-Mu'minun. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ The whole uh, few verses there. Those people, أفلح, those believers have success, salvation. فلاح. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ مُعْرِضُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِلزَّكَاةِ فَاعِلُونَ And then Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ Those who preserve their private parts, their modesty. They guard their chastity. لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ Except from the spouses. There's one legitimate halal usage. There's one area where your sexual passion can be manifested. There's only one area. And this is the Islamic approach of moderation. We need to remember this. You know, there's two extremes. There's an extreme to the right and there's an extreme to the left. In some faith communities, yeah, in some faith, classically, historically, certain faiths, and maybe even now, without going into taking names because... Nowadays you just even mention a name and, and I don't know what happens. But there's these faith communities. Um, certain faith communities you find even till today. There's one approach that lust, passion, sexual desire is evil, it's wrong, it's filthy, it's sinful, it's dirty, full stop. There is no way, there is no correct way of the manifestation of your sexual desire. There's no correct way. You just have to control it. It's bad evil, full stop. 
That's it. You have to strive, you have to struggle. This is what we call mujahada. That's what they say. In order to get close to God, in order to get close to Allah, proximity to God only comes by striving, struggling. You can't even do business and trade to make money in some faith communities. You can't even enjoy your food. Just eat a bit. You have this life is life of celibacy. This is what they call, this is what Allah called in the Quran Rahbaniya. Allah says, Wa Rahbaniya tadauha ma katabnaha alayhim. This is something which is Rahbaniya. Monasticism. It's called monasticism. Rahbaniya tadauha. They invented it for themselves. They wanted to live a life of solitude. No, 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 no marrying, no business trade, no eating, no socializing. We never implemented or prescribed this for them. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith of Sunan of Imam Abu Dawood, he said, La sarurata fil Islam. And one of the main meanings of La sarurata is there is no celibacy. Another meaning is no leaving of Hajj, but La sarurata. There is no celibacy. Tarkun nikah. Avoiding marriage altogether, this is not Islam. So this was an extreme to the right. Right? To the point that, you know, some of them, they, they said, you can marry. But the husband and wife cannot even be alone in a room. If you want to, if you want to meet your husband or your wife, you, you can only do it in a public place. You can't be alone. And they had nuns and monks living in monasteries. That's where it is. You know, this is an extreme approach. Lust is if you see if you see the Bible, if you see, is one of the deadliest sins. The fourth deadliest sin is called lust. Right? Even even the other religions, they also consider lust to be generally sinful. So this is, there is in some faith communities, there is no correct way of fulfilling one's desires and needs. It's wrong, sinful, full stop. You have to actually struggle and strive to get too close to God. On the other hand, we have an extreme left, which we find in today's time where there are no barriers, there are no conditions, there are no restrictions in how you fulfill your desires. We live in a time where you, a person is allowed to fulfill his or her needs, sexual needs and desires in any way, shape or form, without any conditions, without any contract, without any marriage, in any way with whoever, whether your own gender or another gender, or whatever. It doesn't even have to be a human nowadays. Yeah, seriously. I gave a whole course once. I mean, there's things. I mean, in any way, I mean, you see, it's ridiculous where society is going to. In any way, whoever, whatever, people fulfill the desires. I mean, you should know and you must know. With not even humans, with animals, with dead bodies, with this, within the family sometimes. The list can go on. There is no restriction. Sometimes with force, without force, sometimes. Through, through oppression, rape, and all these things. Sexual crimes that take place. And we, we know, we all is here in the news, the sexual crimes that take place. Islam says, this is إِهْدِنَ الصَّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Middle way, the moderate way, the moderate, middle path. God acknowledges that you have a sexual desire. Allah knows He created you, He knows that this desire needs to be fulfilled. Because if you go to the right extreme, you are challenging the fitrah of Allah. You are challenging what Allah wanted. And whenever you go against the natural way that Allah has created, you always end up, you always end up in chaos and anarchy in the society. And that happened that those people who stayed away from marriage and they thought that they were able to control themselves, most of them could not. There's so many cases, they could not. Behind closed doors, also substance were being committed. Why? Because it's natural. You tell someone you can't fulfill your desires, it's unnatural. Because that's how Allah created a human being. And on the other hand, the other extreme as well, we find today, that's unnatural as well. How many children do not know, more than 50% of children in America, right? I don't know what the percentage is here, maybe the same. Of children, newborn children do not have a clue who their father is. They don't have a clue. They don't know who their father is. I mean, that's a crime. Not just a crime in terms of fornication, but it's an oppression crime towards the son or the daughter, the child. Imagine, I mean, that you grow up and you don't know who your father is. Your first right has been taken away as a human being. That's an inhumane act and that's a crime towards another human being. There's so many people, they, they grow up, they don't know. 
Why? Because of all these liberal, you know, tendencies towards sexuality. That you can fulfill your desires in any way, shape or form. Islam says the middle way. The middle way, this is Islamic position, Islamic stance. And then Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ This is the middle way. إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ Only, only through a valid halal marriage, a valid halal nikah, which brings two, two people close to one another. There's a spiritual bond and link that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places and attaches to the union that, is, that takes place through the union of nikah and marriage. Without that, it's, it's, the, the, it, there's no barakah in it. And, and we see all the problems. So there is no rahbaniya in Islam. There is no celibacy in Islam. There is no celibacy. There is no leaving of marriage. Islam says this is the halal way. Other than that, all the haram ways. Before marriage and even after marriage. All the halal ways, the haram ways, we have to avoid. This is the only, only soul way. Allah says in the Quran, "Wala taqrabu zina." Right, brothers and sisters, "Wala taqrabu zina." Allah says, "Don't forget fornication. Do not even come close to fornication." "Wala taqrabu qurb." "La taqrabu zina." Don't even smell it. Run away, a mile away from it. This is all explanation. That's not the translation. Run a mile away from it. The verse is, لَا تَقْرَبُ zina. Don't even approach it. Don't even come close to it. A woman, رَجُلٌ دَعَتُهُ طَلَبَتُهُ إِمْرَأَةٌ The hadith. A woman is trying to, you know, speak to you in a very flirtatious way. Or a brother is trying to, a man is trying to flirt with you. Run away. Just slap him. If a sister, if a brother tries to talk to you, just slap him one. <laughs> Just, just, just go away from it. Just do not. If you think something might happen, then that's it. You have to. You have to control yourself. And if somebody cannot control themselves, then just get married. Don't wait for anything. Just get married. No, seriously. You, have, you know, I, I just, I actually gave a whole weekend course. Last weekend, I was not even in England. I was in Oslo, Norway. Friday to Sunday. The Saturday, Sunday, we had a fiqh of marriage and divorce course. And there were, it was in the university, University of Oslo. There were a lot of people. We had about 150 people who came for the whole course. And the main question and the main thing that was coming up, because I really focused in the beginning, I do not wait around to get married. I said parents need to be told as well. That there's too many cultural practices, too many self-imposed restrictions. We live in a climate, in a time, there's a lot of fitna. It's very difficult in this day and age. In this day and age to avoid sin, it's very, very difficult. I can understand. Especially in universities and places, I'm not trying to justify it, but I can understand. Right? I mean, I don't study in, in UCL or Imperial or whatever. Right? I, I am, there's no women there. So I know it's very difficult for you. I can stand here and tell you, you know, just fear Allah. And it is very difficult. It is very, there are a lot of temptations out there. You're in the midst of a lot of trial and tribulation. But that's, that's the challenge. That is the challenge. The more difficult, the greater the reward. But the, yeah, so I said I focused a lot on marriage. Don't wait. Don't, you know, all these self-imposed restrictions, cultural restrictions. There was, there was, I remember a sister asked a question, she was a Moroccan sister, and she's 16, and after that, she was going to be 17, she said, is it too early for me to get married? I said, no. And she really wanted to get married. I remember, it's just, this on Sunday. I really focused, I said, get married at an early, don't wait, don't wait, you don't have to graduate. You don't have to, because... You know, the, the type of financial things we have in our heads and minds, like there was a Palestinian brother who used to be a good friend of mine once when I was studying in Syria, and he used to tell me that it's so difficult to marry here, in Syria and places like that, because there's, nobody will give you their daughter unless you don't have three keys, key to your car, key to your house, and key to your business. The mahar dowry extortion amount. These are all self-imposed restrictions. You can't get married until your great grandfather doesn't come back from Punjab or something. <laughs> you know, this uncle has to come from there, and that uncle has to come from there, and from India, or whatever. People have to. You have to wait for the whole world. I mean, look at the time of the Sahaba, the Messenger of Allah, one sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He saw Abd Rahman ibn Auf, radiyallahu anhu, a companion. He saw him. He didn't see him. He saw him with a yellow stain on his clothes. He said, "Oh, Abd Rahman, what's this yellow color?" He said, oh, um, last week I got married, 
And I applied some perfume, it's probably some effect of the fragrance. I said, oh, you got married last week. Yeah, I got married. So what? Believe. I ate food, I had breakfast. <laughs> it's like that, seriously. That's how the Sahaba were. And then said, oh, but he, he never even complained. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not complain. He never said, oh, you didn't call me. You know, like some Imam today said, Astaghfirullah, you got married. Where's my invitation? Did I call you when I was having breakfast? No. It's just a simple, seriously, that's what Muslims thought about marriage, simplicity. No restrictions, no conditions, simple as possible. People, this is how people are satisfied. Parents make it difficult, we live in a time when things are made difficult on young people. And if Islam allows you to fulfill your desires in the best of ways, in the halal ways, and it's, it's a natural desire, it's difficult to control it, so then get married in a halal way, Allah will place barakah. Allah will place barakah. But outside marriage, don't even get close to fornication. Allah says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ zina." Anything that leads to it. Anything that leads to it. وَلَا تَقْرَبُ zina." إِنَّهُ كَانَ fahisha. It's evil. And then Allah says, وَسَاءَ sabila." It opens the doors to other sins. لَا يَزْنِ الزَّانِ حِينَ يَزْنِ وَهُوْ مُؤْمِنٍ Iman, the person does not even remain a mu'min when he's at the time of fornicating. Anything that even takes you to fornication needs to be avoided. This is what Islam says. Before marriage as well. You cannot before marriage. Dating is out of the question. For Muslims, dating and having a you know illicit relationship, even if you don't do not, even if you do not go all the way to actual illegal sexual intercourse, even to the point that Islam says casting a lustful gaze. Casting a lustful gaze. I'm talking about lustful gaze. Right? As a member of the opposite gender is clearly condemned in the Quran. Tell the believing man to lower the gaze and preserve the modesty. Tell the believing women to lower the gaze. Because it leads to, one thing leads to another. You know, once there'll be a look and then there'll be a smile and then it'll be in the bedroom. Or somewhere, no, sorry, a look and then a smile and then in the coffee shop. Right? And then maybe in the library. And then in the bedroom. Yeah, one thing leads to another. You know for a fact, one thing leads to another. This is this is how we have been created. We, you know, the sexual the sexual instinct is the weakest instinct of the human being. And Shaytan knows that. Iblis Satan knows that. This is where that this guy can slip. The attack is on the sexual instinct. It's it's the most easiest way. People of piety have slipped. People who've been living a life of righteousness, of religiosity. People who've been practicing, God-fearing people. There are cases in history where this sexual instinct, a sin there, just made them slip and they went far away from the path of Islam. Shaitan knows. He knows. He knows. He knows the game. He knows our weaknesses. It's a very. It's, it's one of the greatest weaknesses we have, especially in this time. So before marriage, just avoid it completely. Listen. You know, Allah says in the Quran. Fear of Allah. This fear of Allah. You know, at the time of marriage, we are reminded of taqwa. This taqwa has to be before marriage, at the time of marriage, even after. Before marriage specifically as well. Don't think to yourself, I'm not married, let me just mess around right now. Because I tell you one thing, and I've said this on a lot of occasions. Once you get a habit of messing around, that habit will remain with you until you're a six-year-old Buddha. You know what a Buddha is, yeah? I mean, the Asians know that. Until you're a six-year-old old man. You're a sheikh. Sheikh actually means an old man in Arabic. But we use it, you know, shaykh, whatever. But literally speaking, linguistically, shaykhun and shaykhatun. Shaykh means an old man. Shaykh means an old woman. But we use it for imams and, and people. It's just, it's just a terminology. It's not, it's not an Islamic terminology. Whatever, like in different places, different countries, people use different terms, whatever. But you, if, you, if we do not sort ourselves out before marriage, that remains a habit even after marriage. That's why it's highly important that if you want to get married before marriage, at least six, seven months, a year before, just make tawbah to Allah, repent. Live a life of six months to a year of chastity. Live a life of chastity, then get into marriage. Because if you get into marriage on the back of 
unlawful things that you've done, and I'm not just talking about zina and fornication, but I'm talking about anything that leads to it and anything that's related to it. From castful, lustful gazes to whatever, all the things that we know people do sometimes in privacy. Right? Everything. All of the things. If we do not control ourselves before marriage, then after marriage, that's why we have problems in marriages. I speak to people on a regular basis. Where men specifically who have had habits before marriage carries on into the marriage and some are apparently looking they're practicing, apparently, externally. But they've got these habits in privacy that they've been doing before marriage. I mean, I've spoken to so many women like that, wives, who've got children. And those habits are not dying. They cannot control their habits. Because there was no taqwa before the fear of Allah before marriage. Before, I remember, you know these relationships, they don't work. Before marriage, they don't work, without a doubt. It's not going to the sisters, first of all, for the sisters, don't get deluded and deceived into a brother saying, I want to marry you and all of that. You know, it's just... Tell you, if you want to marry me, you know, you, 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 you won't have a relationship, you're just not suitable anyway. You're going to do this today, when I marry you, probably do that. You're going to, if he's got a habit right now, you'll be married to him, and after five years, he's going to do that with someone else. I know hundreds of cases. And I speak to people on a regular basis. I have a six to eight phone line where people call me on a regular basis. Emails, I have a Q&A website. On a regular basis, this is one of the mainstream problems. Marital problems are the biggest problems in today's society. Everywhere in the West. Divorces are on the high, on the rise. Everywhere in the West. When I was in Toronto, they were telling me that one in four Muslim marriages end up in divorce in Canada. One in four. It's a big problem. One of the reasons is because of what we see in front of us with the fitna. So if, if he's doing that with you today, then he is not suitable to be married. Just slap him and tell him to go. You know, he's not suitable for marriage because he's going to carry on like this after marriage as well. And also brothers, you know, sisters who like that thing, just, just avoid, don't, you know, do not be seduced. Control yourselves. And if you really want, want to like someone's habits, then, then get married. Before marriage, you know, some people say, oh, how can you get married if you, can't, if you can't date? There's no feelings before marriage. You know, in Islam, love only starts after marriage. They say, you know, one of the chefs, one of them said that, they say in the West, that love is a madness that ends with marriage. We say in Islam, love is a madness that only begins with marriage. There's a hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is a sound hadith in the Sunnah of Imam ibn Majah. He said, Lam tara lil mithl nikah. You won't see anything that creates more love between two people like marriage. The special barakah and blessings granted by Allah. Before marriage, you can, you know, you cannot create feelings. It's lust. Before marriage, it's not love. It's lust, and it's just you cannot get to know anyone before. It's impossible. Look, I tell you, you know, you think, okay, let me get to know this person, this sister, this brother, six months. You know, I want to date them. I want to find out how they are. You know, for six months, for a year, it will all be artificial behavior. No one's the true self. I mean, do you live together? Are you twenty-four hours seven together? Are you twenty-four seven together? Are you sleeping together? Are you, are you waking up? I, I, you know, do you see this woman? Like after marriage, you'll see her every time. You'll see her the moment she wakes up with makeup, without makeup, the moment she's come out from the toilet, the moment you know, she's in the kitchen, she's got an apron on, she's smelling of curry. You'll see her. She's, <laughs> and like the brother as well, you'll see her on all occasions. And when you're dating, you're getting dressed up for the occasion. Friday, Saturday, you know, all the perfume and fragrance and the brother, you know, he's like he's shaving or whatever. If he's, you know, trimming and... Yeah, inshallah, he shouldn't be shaving. But um, you know, just, <laughs> he's, he's putting on, you know, his nice best gear and this and that, and he's trying to impress. And then he comes and picks the sister up and everything. And it's all dating. It's all artificial. It's just, it's just artificial behavior. He's not, he's not his normal self. And then he goes and you know, outside it's so it's cold and he's probably take his jacket off. Sister, sister, here, you know, you're feeling cold. It's straight. You have my jacket. Wear my jacket. And then you know, open the door for the car. You sit in a restaurant. You know, it's cool. You sit down. You know. Will you do that after two years, ten years of marriage? You're not going to do that after two years of marriage. <laughs> it lasts for two, one month, after month, one month, after he's been where he's been, and, and he's had the relationship. Most of them are not going to do that. That's why I tell the people, be your normal self. How are you going to be after 30 years of marriage? Be like that on the first day of marriage. No expectations. And then sisters think, wow, this brother, 
she's always so good, he treats me so good, you know, he really, he treats me so well. And then, they get married, and he's no longer like that. What happens? He gets disappointed, she gets disappointed. And that leads to divorce. That's why don't have any expectations. That's why dating will never, you will never, never get to know someone. Because you're not living with them. You're not, you're not living 24-7. You're not sharing everything and anything. You're not going to buy nappies together. You're not paying the bills together. Seriously, this is reality of life. Whereas, what, what does Islam say? Find out everything about them. Not through them, but through third party. You can meet them, have a meeting, attraction and things like that. But then do your investigation and research. I'm concluding, inshallah. Do your investigation and research through people. Find out all the qualities, all the attributes, all the negatives, all the positives. Do as much research as you can from third party sources. Whether he's angry, whether he's not angry, whether she's someone who's always fighting, quarreling and bickering with everyone. Is he a jealous person? Is she a jealous woman? Does, does she always backbite? Does she always bicker? Does she always fight? Or is she someone that's really clean hearted and just is very simple, clean hearted, doesn't have no grudges towards anybody? You can find this out from third party sources. And that will keep, maintain your marriage. That will help the marriage. So before marriage, we have to be very careful. No, Allah says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ زِنَّا Even castful, lustful, casting lustful gazes and all the other sins that we know. Right? We need to control ourselves. We need to take the means. I'm going to end with this. Look at the story of Yusuf, peace be upon him. He took the means. وَرَاوَدَتْهُ الَّتِي هُوَ فِي بَيْتِهِ عَنْ نَفْسِهِ وَرَاوَدَتْهُ الَّتِي هُوَ فِي بَيْتِهَا عَنْ نَفْسِهِ You know, uh, the, the, the one whose house فِي بَيْتِهِ عَنْ نَفْسِهَا the, the, the master, and, and she was the, uh, the, the wife of the, the, the king of Misr. She seduced him. She, tried, she wanted to have an unlawful, illicit relationship with him. Nobody in the house. She locked, bolted the doors, locked. Where are you going to go? I'm a woman here now. And she was no ordinary woman. She was, again, Imra'atu Jamal, Dhatu Jamal in Wansar. She was beautiful as well as she was princess, the queen. She's a queen. And she locked the doors. And she wanted to have an unlawful, illicit sexual relationship with him. What did he say? Qala ma'ad Allah. He said, I take, I take refuge and protection in Allah. And then in the Quran, he ran, it says, he ran. You know, he ran towards the doors. He did whatever was his in his, you know, the doors were locked. But Yusuf, what did he do? He never thought to himself, well, look, the doors are locked. If I go there, what's going to happen anyway? She'll come there. <coughs> right? He never thought that. He ran to the doors. He did what was in his means. He knows that, look, I can run from here to there. From there, it's not in my hands. Then I leave it to Allah. He ran to the doors. He did what was in his capability, his means. Left the rest to Allah. Allah opened the doors automatically. He kept on running and the doors were being opened. She tried to pull him from the back. It's all in the Quran in the story of Yusuf. So we have to, this is a challenge. We have to try our best, brothers and sisters. I know there's a lot of questions in this topic. We can carry on and on and on. But we're just going to end here, inshallah.